All right, well, um, welcome everybody. And um, thanks for coming to our uh, NOVA webinar. Um, today, uh, we're welcoming uh, uh, Jasmina Aganovic, um, who is the uh, current CEO of um, Arkea, which is a um, uh, uh, biotech expressive biology uh, new company um, uh, in the East Coast, uh, that's um, uh, an offshoot, I guess, uh, or a expansion of uh, Ginkgo Bioworks. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, uh, she was president of Mother Dirt, which is was just a, a leader in in skin microbiome um, um, and really, really great, interesting product. And prior, and uh, she has a degree in chemical and bio biological engineering from MIT. And, um, and today we're going to talk about uh, kind of the role of, of uh, biotechnology in um, green and new uh, novel uh, approaches to um, chemistry. Yes, so. thank you for the introduction, Michael, uh, and thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, I'm really excited to be sharing what we're doing at Arkea with all of you. As Michael had mentioned, uh, we are a young company. We're barely a year old. Um, uh, and so just really uh, happy to be sharing our perspective on what the future of our industry could look like uh, from a biology uh, standpoint. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen here. And Michael, just flag me down if you see anything on your end that isn't coming across uh, quite quite right. Okay, but it looks good. Um, you know, today we're talking about biotechnology as a creative tool for innovation, uh, and this is actually quite a bit different than how people have been talking about biotechnology thus far. And uh, hopefully, by the end of this presentation, um, you'll see you'll see why. Uh, just to introduce our company a little bit, uh, we call ourselves a biology first beauty company, uh, and you'll hopefully soon see what we mean by that. Um, but as I had mentioned, we're just about a year old. Uh, we are based here in Boston in the seaport. We're a team of about 20 people uh, with a mix of backgrounds. I would say most of our team is actually technical uh, with the remainder being commercial and operational. And we have people with a mix of backgrounds, most of which are not from the beauty industry. So we have folks with experience in uh, proteins and polymers, people with uh, expertise and backgrounds in uh, microbiology and the skin microbiome. Uh, people with expertise in skin biology and bioinformatics. And so it's a really interesting melting pot of backgrounds here um, on, on our team. Um, and so you'll see how we're putting all of that to work uh, and uh, what we're really using those backgrounds to be able to accomplish. We're also really fortunate to have great partners working with us. Um, so we have partnerships across the value chain of our industry. So we're fortunate to have strategic investors um, in uh, specialty chemicals uh, partner uh, with Jividon, and they're a strategic investor of ours, as is Chanel and Olaplex. Um, you know, so we're spanning consumer facing companies that have a long time horizon with which they're looking at market impact. Uh, and then you also have newcomers, companies like Olaplex that are completely disrupting uh, entire categories like hair care. Uh, so we have a great mix of perspectives and expertise uh, also around the table as strategic investors um, and partners. And so we'll start perhaps with a, a more familiar point for, for this audience here. Um, it's very likely that you've been seeing headlines that go something like this, right? Uh, is biotech the solution to a more sustainable industry? And where I really wanna start this talk off with is really defining what biotech actually is and what it means. And for some of you, this will be like repetitive information, um, but I also see that uh, many people um, uh, find it useful to understand exactly what we mean when we talk about biotech. I've spoken to a lot of people in the industry who think anything that is biology adjacent is just de facto 
biotech. Um, I, I even spoke to someone that was developing kind of a competitor to Invisalign and he called it biotech because it was like a new way of changing the shape of teeth. And I was like, oh, that's actually not biotech. Uh, so um, I wanna spend some time uh, explaining exactly what biotech is and really contrasting it with what I generally refer to as chemistry. So these are like big generalizations. Um, and if you want to get smart with me, which my team has, they're like, oh, well, biology is technically a bunch of chemical reactions. And it's totally true. So these are generalizations, but really meant to kind of paint a picture. So with industrial chemistry, we're talking about extracting ingredients from a starting source and running them through a process to create the chemical ultimately that is used in the industry. With biotech, you're growing those ingredients within a cell. And so an interesting kind of comparison or phrasing that I use for this is that they're kind of both doing the same thing actually, just at vastly different scales. So in the case of chemistry, you are extracting some sort of feedstock. So, you know, petrochemicals, plants or animals, and then you're taking it through a process that includes temperature, pressure, like immense amounts of heat within a factory or a processing plant to ultimately distill and create the ingredient that will be used in the products that we're formulating with. That is sort of how many ingredients today are created. In biotech, I say the same thing is happening because cells have this thing called a metabolism. And it's basically doing that. It's like temperature, pressure, heat, just at the micro, micro, micro level, all of these chemical reactions happening as a result of the cell's metabolism to make the ingredient ultimately that you use. So it's just a vastly different scale. And so what some people started asking is, oh, can we start to harness what is really good about the fact that cells are able to do this and use it to make things that are of value and have a smaller footprint. So here's what something like that looks like, right? So in the case of current sourcing approaches, you have plants, animals, petrochemicals, you hit it with high energy requiring needs, and then you distill it to get your ingredient that you will ultimately formulate into a product. In biotech, you're also starting with a feedstock, for example, a sugar you're feeding it to a microbe and it's in that microbe's metabolism, in its cellular machinery that it's doing all the work, right? And the way that you're growing that material is through a fermentation, right? Lots and lots of cells. So the cells with the ability to make this ingredient are multiplying and growing. So that's how you get scale. Uh, versus in industrial chemistry, the way you get scale is through getting more of your feedstock, right? Here, the way you get scale is through more of the growth of your microbe and you're able to reduce your dependence on feedstocks. Not completely, but you're able to reduce your reliance. You ultimately separate out the ingredient you want and you're able to formulate it into a product. And so instead of something that takes up a very large footprint and requires a lot of energy, like typical chemical processing plants, you can create a process that has a much smaller footprint and is a very closed loop. So these are small fermenters. Um, these are Amber 250s. For those of you in this world, you will recognize these. Um, and the point here is not that it completely has no footprint and it uses no feedstocks, right? Those are not the statements I'm making, but it drastically reduces the footprint and it drastically reduces the feedstock. Um, and the degree to which that reduction happens really depends on what you are making. The other benefit with this is that it's very closed loop. So instead of taking things through a factory where you're changing equipment and machines a lot, you could end up with impurities. We've seen this happen um, uh, a lot recently. Uh, for example, the recent um, uh, findings of benzene with, uh, with sunscreens. 
Um, you are less prone to that through a biotech or fermentation process uh, because the purity is much easier to control for. Um, and also because it's closed loop, uh, the likelihood of impurities is greatly reduced. And so kind of pulling all of that together, right? Biotech is effectively biology as technology. Um, and an example of some ingredients that are created using this um, are as follows, right? Panthenol used to be derived from petroleum. Some of it still is. But right now it can also be created through bacteria and fermenting bacteria. Squalene um, was derived from sharks, and now uh, there's a company, Amaris, that has created a microbe that is able to create a form of this um, without needing to harvest um, uh, animals. And then perhaps the most popular one is hyaluronic acid, and I'm actually so proud to be able to say that the beauty and the personal care industry was one of the earliest adopters of biotech because of hyaluronic acid. So in the 70s and 80s, when the animal rights movement really started to pick up, the industry was using hyaluronic acid, but it was sourced for, uh, from rooster combs. Uh, and, and my understanding of that is that, that, that that's the red part of, of rooster combs. And as the industry saw the animal rights movement gaining momentum, they knew that they needed to come up with an alternative. And they turned to biotech. Uh, and in fact, it was Shiseido that created uh, one of the first forms of recombinant hyaluronic acid. But the story of hyaluronic acid is actually a really important one. Because today, when we look at the presence and the power that hyaluronic acid has in the industry, it's a, it's a staple, it's well-respected, it's well-tolerated, um, it's recommended by dermatologists. The reality is that hyaluronic acid would not be as influential as it is today, was it not for biotechnology. And that I think is a learning lesson that we carry a lot at Archaea. Basically, the, the thesis here is that because of the sophistication and precision of biotech, we were able to start to do a lot more with hyaluronic acid that we could not do with sourcing through animals. Effectively, scientists started to see, okay, if I source from an animal, yes, there are ethical issues that consumers are not interested in, but actually now with biotech, I can start to tweak the parameters of hyaluronic acid. And this is part of the reason we have so many different forms of hyaluronic acid that are in the market today. And so in a very generalized sense, the ability to have more precision around how we create things takes something from simply being a swap to something that starts to expand in terms of what is possible with it. And so, of course, you know, an ingredient like hyaluronic acid or an ingredient like squalene is, is, is dominant in the market today. So consumers have not only accepted, but they've embraced ingredients made through these technologies. They are high performing ingredients that are well tolerated from a safety standpoint. And so building on our story from hyaluronic acid, I started to pose the question of, well, what if biotech is not just a utilitarian manufacturing tool, right? What if biotech is not just about making the things that we've been making just more sustainably. But what if everything associated with it was actually at our fingertips to do new things? So just like what happened with hyaluronic acid, what if we could start to create entirely new possibilities? And this is where this element of creativity surrounding innovation starts to, to come to life. Um, so we were chatting here uh, a, a little bit before everyone uh, joined. Uh, Gay, Michael, and Katie and I were talking about Mother Dirt. Um, this was a brand that I ran and operated for over four years. Um, it was a skin microbiome brand. And uh, that was really where I fell in love with biology because I saw how amazing it was and what it was capable of. I mean, biology can do things that chemistry alone cannot. It can self-replicate. It can self-repair. Um, but the challenge is that the tools to work with biology and beauty did not exist, right? At Mother Dirt, we needed to like figure out how to formulate. We needed to figure out how to manufacture things differently. We needed to figure out how to ship things differently. 
And the guidance I was generally getting from the industry was, well, just retrofit your biology into this industrial chemistry stack that was never built with biology in mind. Um, and that was challenging to do, obviously. Um, but the question that I started to think about is, well, if biology is so powerful, why don't we start building tools around it to enable it? And what would those tools start, start to look like? And so um, after my time at Mother Dirt, I spent uh, close to two years at a biotech company called Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, also here in Boston, to really understand, you know, what is biotech to a large degree? What is the technology capable of today? What is the technology capable of in the future? Um, and this photo here is one of Ginkgo Bioworks foundries. And so what's in this foundry is a vast amount of technology and robots, uh, many of which have really only been uh, feasible uh, in, in the last two decades. Um, and so what I started to realize is that many of the technologies that Ginkgo was working with um, and that you see here in this foundry are technologies that have emerged and matured over the last two decades. They're pretty new. Um, and it's not just fermentation and it's not just DNA sequencing, it's things like bioinformatics and it's things like protein design and engineering and it's things like the skin microbiome. These are all new lenses into the world that are underutilized in, in beauty. And so I started to think of, you know, how do we, how do we start to take all of these tools that are biology focused, that are new and emerging over the last two decades, and how do we deploy them to create really good solutions for consumers in beauty and personal care? And so the reason I got excited about this was because I fundamentally believe that all the products that we're using today are shaped by the technical tools that we have, right? When we talk about different textures like moisturizer versus serum, like those have only been able to emerge because of formulation, sophistication, and different types of ingredients that are able to enable that. The, the first moisturizers were very rudimentary. Um, when we think about the proliferation of products and hair care, like those were things that became enabled through different technical advancements and formulation, chemistry, and ingredients. And so I got really excited about what new things might be possible when we start creating new tools for the industry to be able to work with. Um, and my cheesy representation of what that is, is basically this slide. I always call it a cheesy slide, but you know, I, I think about the tree of life, right? You think about biology, biology is, is everywhere. Um, biology made all of us. Um, and uh, if we think about this like map of biology that exists on the tree of life and all the molecules that um, exist on this planet, and then you think about where the cosmetics and personal care industry has been sourcing their ingredients from, um, it's been petrochemicals, plants, and animals, you know, trying to reduce reliance on petrochemicals, trying to move things away from animals. And my commentary is nothing associated with ethics or sustainability at this point. So that is not something I'm bringing to the table. When I look at this, I do not think about any of those things. I think, wow, the industry is trying to push everything towards plant-based. And that's a small part of the tree of life. Like what are all the things that we are missing? because we're just playing in this one thing. And playing in this one thing has created an incredible industry, right? $500 billion, it's omnipresent in consumers' lives. That is remarkable. But what would start to happen if we were able to play in other parts of the tree of life? What functionalities would we be able to create? And we can do that now ethically and sustainably. So at Archaea, we call this expressive biology. It's a little bit of an homage to biotech because um, cells express things. They'll like express proteins when they're producing something. But also self-expression is so core to the world of personal care. And so we envision a future where biology, people's biology is used as a tool of self-expression. And so... That brings us really to Archaea and, and what we're doing. And, and the way that I talk about our mission is that we want to make biology the most desired technology in, in this industry. 
And so I want to take you through a couple of examples of some work that we're doing that hopefully bring this I, idea of like creativity with biotech to, to life. So I mentioned we're based in Boston. Um, uh, most of our team is technical. We have a, we have a lab here. Um, and if anyone is here is passing through Boston um, and is interested in coming by for a visit, I, I very much uh, welcome that. Um, we're doing a lot of work in keratin proteins. And so right now, uh, many of you probably know keratin proteins are currently available in the market. They're animal sourced. Um, and we, through biotech, can, can create a vegan version of that. But that's not really where we are stopping. What we are starting to think about is how we can tie principles of protein design to hair performance. And the way that this idea came about was uh, during my time at Ginkgo, I was talking to a lot of experts in the space, and I realized that so much of hair care is surface chemistry. And I wanted to understand why, because so many people have been fascinated with keratin proteins for a long time. And, and the story that starts to emerge is that in the 80s, 80s and 90s, scientists were actually fascinated with hair as a material. Um, because if you think about what we put our hair through, it's remarkably resilient. If I put, you know, the shirt that I'm wearing through the same things that I put my hair through, this shirt would disintegrate probably within 30 days. And so scientists naturally really wanted to understand, hey, what is it about keratin proteins in hair that give it these remarkable properties? And then, of course, the next logical question is, how do we start to harness that? But in the 80s and 90s, we did not even know what proteins looked like. Like we only had 3D models as a human race. We had 3D models for like 2000 proteins, right? Like the, that world was just so nascent. Our ability to like see into proteins was very minimal. And so the field of hair care moved to surface chemistry and it was really focused on coating the hair in a way that makes it feel in the desirable fashion of the end point that the consumer is looking for. And so what I really love about the work that we're doing here is that we're going back to those same questions, but the slate of tools is entirely different, right? What we've done with this program is we've done a high throughput screen of tens of thousands of different keratin proteins and keratin fragments. We've started to model out how they start to bind to one another. And then we want to assemble very specific proteins that are tied to a performance benefit. So our dream here is not just to create a vegan keratin, but for us to figure out how to design a keratin protein that is able to change the shine pattern of your hair. And then another keratin protein that can influence the shape of your hair. And then another keratin protein that perhaps can structurally repair your hair and so on and so forth. And so these are things that are not possible through conventional sourcing methods. They only become possible through high precision, high sophistication that we now have access to thanks to the advancements in these technologies. Our company is actually focused on four different technical platforms. I just talked to you about our sensory platform, which is our, we call it memory hair care. Um, but we have four areas that we are pursuing. Um, we're doing work in the microbiome. Um, so you probably won't be surprised after what I told you about Mother Dirt. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of opportunity here to create precision prebiotics, um, postbiotics, as well as probiotics. Um, and we're also creating actives, uh, additional proteins um, for well aging. Um, so our belief is that um, the, the, the appearance of our skin is not just influenced by collagen and elastin. They play a very big role, of course, um, but there's a whole host of other proteins that uh, play a big role in that. And then this last one here is on environmental filters. Um, how can we create more sophisticated methods to protect our skin and our hair from the environmental elements? And so, you know, one of the most important takeaways I hope I can share is that Arkea is not using biotech as purely a manufacturing tool. Um, we are using biotech to create new types of ingredients. Um, and so here, you know, we talk about things like a perfume derived from an extinct flower or heat styled hair that lasts for multiple washes, right? This notion of memory hair care. 
And we hope that the timing is certainly good, right? Consumers are uh, relentless in saying that they're not going to compromise their values around ethics and sustainability and performance. Um, and we're starting to see these technologies start to enter consumer categories, right? You see companies like Impossible Foods as an example. And then in terms of our business model, like how is this going to show up in the world? Um, we're going to have two business channels. Uh, one is actually selling these technologies as ingredients to the industry. Um, this is really important to us because part of this industry is, is based on creativity and we can't wait to see what brand creators and formulators do with these technologies. And we will also be creating brands of our own. Um, in some cases, uh, as was the case with Mother Dirt, for example, um, it makes sense to launch uh, a brand on your own to start to establish um, new categories or uh, to manage storytelling that needs to be managed uh, very closely. And so we're coming to the end here, um, but really my prompt for the group here is if we think about new tools for this industry, what types of things can we reimagine? Um, and to give you a sense of like what is happening internally here at Arkea, you know, we think about like quite literally a list of claim spaces and then like the chemical mechanism by which we access those claim spaces. Um, how would biology do it, right? And where in nature can we find a molecule or a group of molecules that would be able to do that? And how can we even improve upon it? Um, and so that's sort of the, the thinking and the shift and the reimagining that um, we are, are trying to, to do here. And I think that that is it. So thank you, everyone. I don't know, Michael, if you have any questions or if you wanted me to talk a little bit more about something um, specific. Well, no, that was, that was uh, great, succinct, and very informative. So thank you very much for that. Um, I don't think there's been any questions yet in the, the chat, but um, mm -hmm. uh, does anybody, uh, so I, 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 can, I can open up some, some questions. Uh, I have a couple. Sure. So like you, you touched on it a little bit, um, but from your perspective and, and kind of maybe some, uh, so how some of the brands are in uh, ingredient suppliers and even maybe, you know, the um, uh, users, end users, uh, do you feel like the, like, can you, def I don't know, rank order is the right word, but like you kind of like trying to explain why to, to consumers and, and it's kind of like, you kind of got climate change, you've got the sustainability. And I think yeah. recently there's the supply chain kind of logistics thing, right? Just like it, it's here, it's close to home, it's uh, or close to wherever you are. Do you, do you feel like there's something that's kind of like leading kind of the, the general um, reason that um, people are more interested in this? Yeah. I think it's a different thing probably for different people in the value chain. So like, I think for raw material companies and chemical suppliers, supply chain consistency is really important to them. Mm -hmm. um, sustainability is really important to them. For consumers, I don't know how people will feel about the statement. I know consumers say that they care about sustainability, but uh, they care about performance more is uh, my thesis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the consumer and, and the way that we're like focusing on the things that we're focusing on, it's very performance centric. And even while we were like booting up the business, I actually felt like a collective sigh of relief often from people like that we were trying to either partner with or raise money from where they were like, okay, this is like performance oriented, really like this. It's super compelling and it happens to be more sustainable. So that's great versus this is the more sustainable way to do things. Um, and, and that was kind of interesting for, for me to observe. Like there's this need to be more sustainable, but the performance just needs to, needs to be there. Yeah. I, I, we concur as we've, talked about it over other webinars and even in our own internal team, 
talking about green chemistry at a consumer levels pr proves to be difficult, right? And um, and so there's like a, a reassurance level and then it just goes right into performance. But uh, I do know that, you know, we're, when when it comes to the natural conversation, right? When, and and certainly even, you know, like Gay's, Gay is on this, you know, she's on the spectrum of just like all organic and that's beautiful. And a lot of people are really wary though of, of bio, right? We need to you start with those three letters. Um, and so, you know, I think part of where we're at is also trying to say, okay, well, we need to like, what are some tools that we can use to help explain? I mean, I saw on the slide there, you know, reduced imp in reduced impurities, pesticide free, maybe allergen free. Um, are there any? Is there anything else that you kind of found? And 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 even with your experience with Mother Dirt, which is very difficult uh, kind of product to explain, do you have any other um, ideas around how brands can? Yeah, I think being very rigorous about creating a product or a technology that people love first and foremost, I think is, is super important. Um, and figuring out how to connect them to that is, is the most critical. I'm going to, I'm going to use GMOs as an example. Um, what I've observed is that it quickly leads into a conversation of they're not as bad as people think, they've been demonized, they have all this. And, and I generally am yet to see that be a productive conversation. Instead, what I mean by like creating a product that people love, right? It's, it's sort of like this crazy idea of like, how do you create a GMO derived product that like people love, right? That like is so mind blowing in terms of its performance, people want it it like makes them willing to reconsider their bias, right? I, I think that is, is an critical part of the process, right? Insulin, as an example, right? Life-saving was created through a GMO process. Um, that is improving the quality of life of people everywhere, every single day. So that, you know, was never questioned. No one was like, oh, this is GMO and, and I'm anti that. With consumer products, it's, it's a little bit different, right? Um, uh, because it is subjective. People choose, right, what they, what they want to believe. But even that is not, it's not that simple, right? It's not gonna be that one thing that solves it for everyone. And here is where I think just the sobering truth of these like difficult emerging topics or, or technologies comes to play. It's about transparency and it's about communication and it's about good corporate stewardship and just being relentless and demonstrating to the general public and to your customer or end user that like this is improving their life or that it will improve their life and that you earn their trust. Um, and, and that's just gonna take time and it's gonna take good corporate stewardship. It's not gonna be one thing or one product, um, but, but yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, some of the other questions we've we've kind of tossed around as a as a group and and um, is around that transparency. And I think that that's a key piece to it. Um, and you know, as I've you mentioned, kind of some of the food stuff that's that's happening out there, and and there's some great examples, some products that are you know show up in the news and everything. You know. Yeah. Um, but I also come to learn a lot of, of some of the uh, bio stuff that's actually already happening in the background for consumers, uh, for, or for consumer consumable uh, foods, and and in and to your point, even hyaluronic acid. I, I say most people um, would not know that that's a bio-based ingredient, uh, synthetic, yes, but not maybe uh, bio. What what are your where, how are you thinking, or are you getting involved with any kind of policy around? like um, e explaining that on package or uh, having to have that transparency built into like a policy versus just relying on the uh, brand uh, to either just push it under the rug or just it's not a concern of theirs because it's like you said, it's like, this is a really good product. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know that my answer will satisfy you. Um, I do know that for us, having a product in market will be a really valuable tool to be able to have that conversation. We're not going to have product in market until until next year. 
Um, what we hope to do through our ingredients business is set a better standard around how ingredient claims can be communicated, um, what can be discussed, what can be talked about, the, the level and the state of the science and not talking beyond where the science is, but speaking directly to where the science actually is currently. But simultaneously, and this is why we have two parts of our business, on the brand side that's very close to the consumer, we also need to be starting to plant the seed around biology oriented possibilities. Uh, and so what we hope to do with our brands over time is to start with a biology light story and then progressively build into something that could be more challenging or seem to be more challenging today. But by that point, there will be other existing proof points that will perhaps leave consumers a little bit more open to, uh, to <coughs> concept of bio-based ingredients. There's another controversial view that I tend to subscribe to, which is that how, how critical to the success of biotech is it for consumers to understand what biotech actually is? And one could say that, you know, similar to the iPhone, Gay, I think Larry gives this example all the time and I really love it, right? If we look at how transformative the iPhone was in our lives and all the technology that emerged with it. But like, I can't code an app. I have no idea what to do with it, right? I don't understand anything about it. And yet I use it and I appreciate it. And it's a big part of my life. And hyaluronic acid, you know, one of the most valuable ingredients in the market and people don't know that it's biotech. And so it is interesting to think about how you can get a market to embrace a technology but how much the penetration of like exactly what that technology is matters to drive that, right? Clearly there was some momentum along the way and then it was accepted and then it didn't really even matter anymore, but it was a different time too. So yeah, I don't have a great answer for you, but those are all my, my musings currently. Yeah. I love it. Um, we, Michael. Yeah, go ahead. I, I have a couple of things. I, one of the things I posted on there is what are the range of raw feedstocks you're using because ultimately you are dependent to some degree on plants because that's where carbohydrates come from. Yeah. Um, how are you guys managing that currently? And what? And if you look out, I'm, and I always try to put this in context, uh, you said $500 billion for uh, the cosmetic industry. In the US alone, the food industry is 1.5 trillion that was a number from three years ago. So I'm sure it's more than that now, but it, we are a relatively small player in terms of the amount of stuff we use that said, you know, we, because it's about basically sexy products that people want to buy because it makes some promise. Um, we have a great opportunity to educate. And when you look at the issues of, genetic engineering, which I, again, really separate between GMO as a seed crop and GMMs as a genetically modified microorganisms, which is, I think, a little more precisely what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, how do we, it, it, you are going to have to have some degree of trust. Mm -hmm. We, that's what Apple is going through with their phone right now. When I just had to download that damn Monterey onto my computer. And um, it has to do with privacy and trust and security. And I would argue that that is something that uh, exists in all products, especially something that we're going to put on our skin, mm -hmm. and put on our children. Um, and so, you know, in the, in the big picture, do you guys have a plan when you talk about communicating that to the consumer? I, I disagree with you. I don't think the consumer is going to accept it out of hand. The Walmart shopper will. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who are going to be kind of driving that market with inspiration and higher end products that uh, push innovation are going to be more questioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where are you guys? What do you, how far out are you guys thinking? So if I understand your question, part of it is around, you know, what, what is our communication plan? Mm 
Um, and I think another part of it is related to feedstocks. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, I kind of started at one place and ended up at the other. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I'll start with feedstocks first because that one that one is is easy for us, right? We are not currently biomanufacturing. We have not started hitting pilot scale um, uh, manufacturing levels, uh, and we won't until uh, next year. So I don't have a good answer for you on that. What I can say is that every engineering project that we scope out, we do take feedstocks into mind, right? So it's part of the engineering design of the program to be mindful of the profile of feedstock that you want to use, not only for the cost curve that you want to hit, but for other sustainability objectives that you have. And I will share that some of our strategic investors were very particular on this point, like they wanted to know what our plan was here. Um, even though we are not at the stage of actively doing any sort of precision fermentation, uh, what we started doing last year is actually working with a well-known industry consultant on sustainability objectives, right? How can we from day one start to build a company with sustainability folded in rather than trying to course correct as things are already there? So again, no good answer for you, but we are investing resources and being thoughtful from the beginning. Uh, there's a company named Genomatica who has done a life cycle assessment to provide just like a, a simple um, example of how a biotech process can be measured and how a biotech ingredient compares to its conventional alternative. So, um, you know, that I think can be an easy reference for people to see what the potential reduction, and I, I think it was something like 80% reduction in, in greenhouse gases or something along those lines. The question around communication um, has to be multifaceted, at least my perspective uh, is as such. Um, I so, so here's a couple of, of mindsets that we have around that. Um, if you remember earlier in the presentation, I was like, come by for a visit. We would love to host you. There are a lot of companies who are very closed off in the space. Uh, we are not going to be that. Um, I believe that part of building trust and building our reputation in the industry is being very open um, and inviting people to come by for visits. And we've already had a lot of very large companies in the space uh, uh, take us up on that offer and, and come by and see what we're doing. Um, not a massive wave of influence, but what I'm observing in these conversations is that they want to become internal champions of this technology. And that is so exciting to think about large companies having people at very senior levels starting to advocate for this technology because they are getting educated on it. And so if we can be a resource for them, even if they literally buy zero ingredients for us, if we can be a resource for them and equip them with, you know, the information, the data, um, I view that as a success, right? So that's like a behind the scenes effort that, um, you know, is not necessarily on public display, but it's part of our company and corporate values. Separately from that, it's um, different types of stakeholders, right? So we have a communication strategy for uh, industry and B2B stakeholders. Um, so we're getting, getting ready to start commercializing an ingredient next year. And so we have some great data to share. Uh, and so we do want to be more forward facing uh, as we have more concrete things to share. Uh, so we hope to have a presence and to have several people from our team have a presence at these meetings, again, as an additional um, touch point. Separately, we think about content on our website and speaking in a very grounded and concrete fashion about all of these things. So um, for example, uh, we've spoken internally about how to talk about the topic of safety with GMOs. So in some of these conversations that we've had with large industry players, safety comes up, right? It's the biggest risk that they're trying to manage. And so um, it's important to be very nuanced around what we're talking about when we talk about safety. And so, um, you know, we've prepared a lot of material around this, and we hope that one day we will start to make this public, but it's important to say, oh, it's not just, okay, are GMOs safe, right? It's sort of like a loaded question. You need to explain actually what's going on when we talk about GMOs, right? It is how the cell is chosen. There's a thought process there. How do you choose the cell that you're going to choose to make the thing that you want to make? Then it's about how are you modifying that cell? What are the safety decisions that you're making across each of these things. Then it's 
how do you test for the safety of those ingredients? That's probably the thing that's like most familiar to the cosmetics industry, right? Because it's, it's um, uh, very familiar to that. And then it's how those cells are discarded. Um, and so um, we, we go through each of these just to show that we're like educated on this, but are also trying to craft the right language and wording to kind of talk about these, these things in a very nuanced and specific fashion. And generally, I found that as we start taking people through it, they're like, okay, okay, I got it, I got it. Um, but as we start to get closer to commercialization, we hope that more of this will start to be shared. I still don't think that that's going to win, right? I think we could get the whole industry on board and they can be like convinced. Um, but if consumers are not convinced, they're not going to buy the product. They're not going to buy the technology. And then the industry is going to say, thank God, we don't have to deal with this like hairy loaded subject. And that is why creating these ingredients and technologies that really capture people's imagination around possibilities, right? Saying like, oh, we can only do this through biotech is critical to the company mission, right? That we can show that people are using this technology. We will make the information available for them, how willing the consumer will be to engage to a certain level of detail, we will see. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we view our commercialization effort as critical to demonstrating that this technology is desired by people. So yeah. it's not a, an easy question, right? I think that's why everyone is sort of hovering around it, but consistency and transparency will be key, probably the most important. In Europe, they have regulatory structures around, uh, biosynthesis which we don't have at all in the United States, um, it would be it would be interesting to see if that would give people some assurance because they're very they're very common sense. They're very you know, and as I've said to people, you know, when the um, <clears throat> truck of modified yeast falls over, it's not going to invade the planet. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I'm not concerned about GMMs at all. I I am highly concerned about glyphosate use on genetically modified seed crops, but that's an entirely different technology, really. I I, I really wish there was a different, I, I think biosynthesis might be better <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah but really you know, to your point though, it it's, it's all the same in people's yeah. minds, which is really unfortunate. I think like the, the narrative that I have around this is based on like the following timestamps. It was basically like beauty industry, animal rights movement, industry was reliant on animal products, needed to move away. So companies like Shiseido started using biotech with genetic modification techniques to make this possible. Did it. Industry was happy. Bayer and Monsanto happened and it was like all consumers were like, oh my God, GMOs are like evil. And then the beauty industry was like, oh shoot, <laughs> we're already using this technology. We now need to find a way to regulate it. And so what Europe ended up doing as it relates to the use of uh, biotech and genetic modification techniques from a regulatory standpoint is really interesting, which is that they needed to come up with a definition for genetic modification and their definition for genetic modification. So, so for example, let's say a company wants to design a cell to make hyaluronic acid. Um, they, but they want to not be classified as using genetic modification techniques. So in Europe, what you can do is you can blast your cell with radiation and chemicals and, with the express purpose of modifying the genetics of the cell and hope to get closer and closer to the hyaluronic acid production level that you want, but that's not gonna be classified as genetic modification. Or you could use very precise techniques um, and that would be classified as genetic modification. And Europe views radiation as, and chemicals as something that we're exposed to naturally on a daily basis. So they don't view that as um, you know, lab techniques, but these other more precise techniques are, um, uh, you know, viewed as non-natural. And so that was sort of like how Europe started to develop their definition around that. And I don't know, it's not like you could in a blanket statement say like, oh, well, that's terrible or one is worse than the other. But 
you know, when you blast a cell with a bunch of radiation, you don't know everything that it's going to change. And so a lot of scientists will say, like, I would prefer to just like go in, change the thing that I want to change and then get out and not have to like worry about like, okay, well, what's happening if all this other stuff is is changing. So, so it's interesting, but uh, I, I mean, in the cosmetics industry, the whole GMO topic is because of what happened with Bayer and Monsanto. It's not because of like anything, anything else. Well, um, AMD kind of preceded yeah. all of them, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I think uh, there, there's, there is a, a question that, that, that fits into a little bit of this and it, do, it does, it does make me wonder if there were, and we, we, we talk about it internally about you know, do we do we need another badge that goes on onto a product? But you know, maybe maybe there is a place eventually for a safety badge, right? That that that's an audit of all those four best practices that you mentioned. Um, that would would give um, some some uh, just top level assurance uh, to to uh, something to think about. Um, but uh, Janelle has a question that goes back to the. Um, uh, compliance, global compliance, specifically um, yeah. uh, testing. Uh, China is one example. She's talking about the animal ingredient, you know, especially something that's considered. So I guess you know, keratin and your. I love the tunable stuff. I think that's very interesting, and that's where it's probably going to hit home run. I was just talking to somebody about a tunable surfactant system, um, but um, so when these are end up being novel ingredients, so. I think I, I believe, but uh, how how are you working with this global compliance, especially with brands that are are selling? You know. Yeah. 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 Well, TBD definitely a hot topic of discussion here. Um, yeah, I mean, it it in the case of keratins, right? Keratins have a, a like an inky designation, and so the path is pretty straightforward. With some of the other ingredient targets that we have, um, it could be more challenging. Um, our perspective is that we see a path to not having to file a new inky. Uh, and to be honest, I have some mixed feelings about that. Um, uh, I, my mixed feelings only being that I feel like it, it undervalues um, the, the innovation, right, that's taking place and, and how different it is. Um, but it's really important for us to make this ingredient accessible across global markets. Uh, and so needing to create a new inky is, is obviously problematic. So uh, we're taking it on a case by case basis. Um, but it was a it was one of the most common questions that we got when we were starting the business and raising our Series A. Basically, what our what our global compliance strategy um, was was going to be, um, and the way that we summarize it internally is like think globally but act locally, uh, and really just make sure that we don't get um, lost by uh, lost or discouraged or not pursue something because the global regulatory framework is too challenging. If the opportunity is big enough, we should make sure that it enters the market in, in any capacity um, so that we can get it out there. Cool. Um, all right. Well, it's it's uh, we're, we're at the last few minutes. Um, any other questions uh, from the um, for the for for Jasmina? Mm -hmm. No. OK. Well, I, I think we, you know, uh, we'll just uh, wrap it up and I just it really, really fascinating and um, I will be in Boston later this year and we'll stop by because um, that just sounds like an opportunity to, to learn and, and see something cool. So I really, I really appreciate you taking the time and um, I hope it was uh, um, um, good for you as well. So uh, so then um, just to wrap it up, uh, so we're going to be moving, our Nova series is, is going to move into packaging. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about sustainable packaging and the, and, and some of the choices and different uh, options out there. And it's going to start September 29th, uh, 1 p.m. And it's going to be led with uh, Janelle and Simon, um, uh, Glossary and Trends. And, and um, so the next three webinars we're doing will be on uh, packaging. And so I think uh, with that, if there's no other questions, we can um, call it a wrap. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Uh, really great to reconnect with both of you, Gay and uh, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank for you. This. And I will be in Boston too. I, I really would love to see this. Yeah, yeah, please <clears throat> just uh, email me and let me know and we'll arrange something.
Thanks so much. And everybody, thank you for attending. We uh, look forward to the next webinar. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye, Bye everybody.